Opinions expressed are solely those of the participants and do not reflect the views or opinions of John F. Kennedy University, the National University System, or other affiliates. Welcome back to the Hispanic Serving Institution HSI podcast, Tu Futuro Está en Tus Manos, from John F. Kennedy University. My name is Douglas Lezamera Jr. In 2015, John F. Kennedy University in the city of Pleasant Hill, California, applied for and was awarded a $2.6 million five-year Hispanic Serving Institution HSI grant from the U.S. Department of Education. This podcast series is part of our HSI grants educational outreach to raise awareness with the Latino community of the value and importance of higher education and earning your degree. You will learn about the value HSIs provide Latino college students through customized academic service. We will share information about the support programs offered by the Department of Education and the State of California, as well as programs provided by colleges and universities. This podcast will motivate and inform you about how to realize your dream of attending college. Our guest today, Dr. Cesar Cruz. From marching 76 straight miles to hunger striking for 26 days, Dr. Cesar has dedicated his life to fighting for justice. Born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, he immigrated to the USA at a young age and attended USC Berkeley, graduating with BA in history and educated for 23 years. He most recently served as a dean of secondary school program at Harvard University and co-founded the independent school Making Changes. For the last four years, he has overseen the Homies Empowerment Program in Oakland, California. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much uh, for your time. How are you today? Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what JFK University is doing. And uh, just excited to be here. These are difficult times, but I'm very excited to be here with you. Yeah, you, 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 you say you say right. It's a difficult time. In, in, in how, how are you adapting to these times? How, how are you feeling right now with, with all this craziness of being inside and, and, and everything that's happening? You know, um, if I can be honest with you, it has been really difficult. And so I think I'm a parent and I have three little kids. And so as a parent, you want to be hopeful and you want to be positive with your children. But what happens when you're not always feeling positive and hopeful yourself? Uh, do you fake it? Do you pretend? And I don't like faking or pretending. And then... Uh, for our children, when the decision came that they're going to close all the schools, I think that's when I, it hit our children the hardest. I also come from a background where we've always had to work really hard. And so working from home at the same time that we're doing school for our kids has made it that someone is not getting attention. And little kids have a hard time when they don't get attention. So that's made it really difficult. Then all of a sudden, I began to learn of some former students who have been impacted by the coronavirus, and that really hit home. Uh, then as an organization, we have an organization called Homies Empowerment. When we saw all of our sister and brother organizations, nonprofits, they all closed their doors because they're not considered essential organizations. We had to make a decision. Do we remain closed or do we become an essential organization and do we provide food for our community? And it sounded easy. But what happens if we go out there and we get infected or we infect someone else? Or what if we infect our children? And so that decision was difficult. But for the last two months, we've been doing a freedom store where we provide free groceries and toiletries to our community. And last Tuesday, we had almost a thousand people that came during that day. Uh, and so it's been amazing. It's been difficult. Uh, there's been moments of courage. There's been hard nights of lack of sleep and learning to take care of my mental health through meditation and other things. And the reason I'm giving you such a long answer is because questions like this do not deserve short answers. Um, there is no right way to handle this. And I think it is okay to not be okay right now. It is okay to not be sleeping right now and for us to figure out what's going to work for us. But we have to take care of our mental health. We have to take care of our health and our family's health. And then if we're able to stretch out 
and look into our community and be supportive, I think all of those things are important. But it's been a journey, and I would say kind of one moment and one thought at a time. Definitely. And, and you know, thinking about it, Dr. Cesar, it's that um, as a community, our Hispanic community, we go through things like that even without the coronavirus. So we 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 grow in environments, in challenging environments, right? Um, like you, you have overcome so many struggles and, achi- and achieved such a success. Um, and now you use that to help Latinos create their success. Um, would you be willing to share some of your background history? Sure, sure. And I just wanted, uh, what a beautiful framing for the question. And so when you think about people that are coming from countries where hurricanes become normal and they devastate an entire country and the people still rise. We're thinking about Puerto Rico and other places. When you think about uh, people that come from lands that are on a foundation where there's so many earthquakes, thinking about El Salvador, thinking about Central America, thinking about Mexico, um, thinking about South America. Sometimes these earthquakes devastate everything. They plummet everything and the people still rise. We have learned how to survive the hurricanes and the earthquakes of life. We have had other viruses from smallpox to HIV and AIDS and uh, really, really difficult times. And yet people are still here. So that gives me a tremendous amount of hope to tell you my own story. You know, I could tell it different ways. And so I'm going to tell it two ways because I think it's important how we tell our stories because we're all storytellers. And sometimes we tell our stories through the sadness and the pain and the difficulty. And then we could tell it through the survival and the resiliency and the beauty. So I'm going to try to tell it both ways pretty fast. I was born in a place where we were very, very wealthy and extreme wealth. And what I mean by extreme wealth is that I had an abuela and an abuelo, a grandmother and a grandfather who taught me about my roots, who woke me up at five in the morning so that we could go into the fields and so we could respect uh, food and respect mother nature. And in our great wealth, we didn't necessarily have running water. We didn't have a toilet. We didn't have a television. Uh, We used to bathe in a pila, and a pila is a place where you put water where cows drink, and that's where we would clean it out, and that's where we would bathe. But the reason I say I was very wealthy is because I grew up with a lot of values and a lot of culture and a lot of love. Another way I could tell you the story is that my father abandoned me when I was age two, and then my mother, when I was five years old, she was telling me about this beautiful place this place where you don't need an immigrant rights movement because they treat immigrants really well. You don't need a a Me Too movement or a women's rights movement because they treat women perfectly. You don't need a Brown Lives Matter or Black Lives Matter or Trans Lives Matter because lives and all human beings are respected. You don't need a workers' rights movement because they pay workers a living wage. And this is such a great place that she was talking about. No one would ever get evicted because these human beings don't believe in owning the land and everybody's in a home. Nobody is without homes. My mom had heard about a mythical place called the United States of America. And she thought that this place really existed. So she went there, but she found there was very few immigrant rights and very few women's rights, and very few rights for Latinos or people of color or poor people. She found a place where they call poor white people, they call them trailer trash. And that broke her heart, going to that place. But when she came to this country, I was five years old, and she crossed the desert, and um, she couldn't bring me. So for many years, I was disconnected from my mom. When I was about nine years old, I was reconnected with my mom in a part of the U.S. called Compton, California. I didn't speak much English. It was mostly an African-American community. Everything felt really different. I got exposed to toilets and televisions and other realities. And my mom began to teach me about life. And one of the things that she told me is that in this society, we are labeled illegal aliens. We are called wetbacks and horrible names. 
And I don't know why she was telling me these things, but she was saying that we have no rights that we're less than and not equal to you or someone else. And that really began to hurt my heart. And I began to believe it up here. And I began to act like if I didn't belong and think like if I didn't matter, I began to develop an illegal state of mind. A few months later, my mom was deported. I'm very thankful that my grandmother was there. My grandmother was able to take care of me, but my mom suffered a lot in this country. And so I grew up with a grandmother trying to shelter me, undocumented, trying to learn a new language, trying to understand this society, going to schools that uh, I know we're going to talk about this later, schools and education, but going to schools that didn't really teach me my history. And I was just scared. I was just a frightened little boy wondering, why did daddy leave? Where's mom? And I didn't know that my story is not unique. I didn't know that this happened to many kids, that millions of kids are experiencing this reality. I didn't know that. Uh, so that was my early days, you know, from great wealth uh, with cultura and values coming to the U.S. Uh, in a shock. And what I didn't know about the U.S., the last thing I'll say to this question, is that I was coming really far to another part of Mexico, that the, the state I landed on, the correct pronunciation of it is California. Its neighbor is Arizona, Texas, Nevada, Oregon, and that all of this was Mexican territory. And there was a time where it wasn't Mexican territory. It was indigenous land. And the Mexicas, which are the descendants where Mexicans come from, are part of this land. So what I didn't know coming up is that I actually didn't cross a border but that a border crossed me and that a border crossed us. And so they turned me into illegal. They turned me into a wetback. But when my grandma's grandma was here in the United States, it was actually called Mexico. So I've actually always been here and we've always been here, but they began to call me an immigrant. And so for a long time, Doug, I believed them. I thought I was an immigrant. I don't think that anymore. I don't call myself an immigrant. I don't call myself uh, a minority. I think I've been minoritized, meaning I haven't been taught the truth about who I am. I've been taught that I'm illegal and no human being. Imagine the idea that a human being can be illegal. That means that they don't fit in society. I used to believe these things. And when you believe you're illegal and you're not human, and you're a fool, and you don't belong, you start thinking that way, acting that way, feeling that way, and it impacts your self-esteem and your mental health. So I struggled a lot through all of these things, but I'm excited to talk about the rest of the journey when the time is right, about how do we go from that to a different reality. Definitely, and, and really, we don't choose we don't choose where we born but we choose where is our home and wherever we, we we decide to go it's where we need to make it our home and, and, and feel it like home um it's such a beautiful thing that that you said about wealth right uh, because yeah you're right here um our idea of wealth is it's what actually might not be something wealthy like money like power like those type of things where where the real wealth for us Latinos, Hispanos, is la familia. Real wealth is is los primos. Real wealth is having a, the the barbecue on the weekend. Real wealth is you know playing the street with your friends. That's that's the real wealth that we come with this shadow in in top of us, right? Feeling that we don't belong. Why is so important important for Latino youth to feel understanding their heritage? What what is missing in in, in current in, in the current education programs that that we we cannot feel appreciate we can appreciate our roof right because we're not we're not being educated as well. Wow, you have such beautiful questions and and such a, a great way to weave. Um, thank you for that. Well, um, you mentioned so many beautiful ways that we're wealthy. I'm going to say something in Spanish and then I'll translate it. I, I know we're, we're going to have a conversation later in Spanish too, but I want to say it right for English listeners. My grandfather, when he was alive, 
um, very, very wise. And I had graduated from UC Berkeley and I was really proud of myself. So I'm getting ahead of myself from like, like being age nine to all of a sudden somehow making it to UC Berkeley. And it wasn't an easy journey. Can you believe this? That my undergrad took 17 years. It took three community colleges. It took three jobs and it took two UCs for me to graduate UC Berkeley. It took that long. I started in 1991 and I didn't get my bachelor's degree till 2008. And so that'll be a journey for later. But I was so proud of myself because I did it undocumented, working three jobs. Uh, I felt like I was living the hope of my mom and my grandmother. And when I came to Mexico to visit my grandfather, he was still alive. I told him how proud I was of my degree. And, and he, he hugged me and he loves me. But he said to me in Spanish, en esa escuela te enseñaron del amor? In that school that they teach you about love? And I don't remember taking a class on love. Like, I don't remember that department. And then he asked me, en esa escuela te enseñaron cómo diseñar una casa y cómo construir un hogar? In that place that they teach you how to actually physically build a house and then how to build a home? No, actually, no, I don't remember ever doing that. And he asked me like five or six of those questions. Like, did they teach you how to grow your own food? Did they teach you how to take care of yourself? And I kept saying no. And I'm going to say kind of a, a messed up word right now. I don't, it's not cursing, I, but I don't mean to be foul. And my abuelito said, pues esa escuela te dejó bien requete pendejo. That school left you really dumb. And it hurt me a little bit. But what I realized is that sometimes we mean well in our educational systems. But if in our universities and in our schools, we're not teaching people how to be community members, how to be global citizens, how to show love, how to build homes, how to grow food, the basic things of life. When something like COVID-19 hits, we don't even know how to grow our own food. We don't even know how to take care of our mental health or anything else. We think the world is over, and it's not. And so that's a very long answer. Uh, and I haven't even gotten to the root of your question, but this is why I'm doing it. Because my abuelito also said, Hay gente tan pobre que lo único que tiene es dinero. There are some people that are so poor that the only thing they have is money. And what he meant by that was that when we all die and, and death is a part of life, it's part of the beautiful cycle of life. We miss the people that have passed, but it's, 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 we have a beginning date and we have an ending date and we're not here to like be uh, gloom to anybody. It's just reality. But when you leave this earth, you could have them bury you with your billions of dollars, but you actually don't take them anywhere. They just stay in the grave. And so Money is not the root of wealth because if you're super rich, but you have cancer and nothing can remove that cancer, your wealth is useless. You might have access to the greatest health care, but if it cannot help you with your health, you're impoverished. And if you have all the wealth in the world, but you have no love, no one to love, no one that loves you, you cannot buy love. You cannot buy. I hope. And so I grew up probably, I'm going to say a, a, a difficult word for some people. I grew up like royalty with no running water, with no toilet, but I grew up with so much love. My abuelitos loved me. They taught me my culture, my roots. They taught me language. And now your question that is so important about schools, at least in the United States. Oh, Let's not forget the work of Dr. Tara Yoso, because she would agree with you that we come from very wealthy, wealthy, wealthy culturas. And she created a term and she calls it community cultural wealth. For example, she says that we carry cultural capital when we understand different culturas. She says that if you're nine years old, Cesar, and all of a sudden you have to learn English to translate for your mom in social services, you learn something called navigational capital. 
because you're code switching between two languages and quickly you're navigating different systems. Now, imagine you're living in a van. You only shower once a month. Seven of you are in that van. You don't have your own clothes. You don't have access to a shower. I'm describing many of my neighbors here in Oakland, California, who are currently living in a car. But somehow you still want to go to school. Somehow you still have a lot of hope. Sometimes you still smile because your family's cracking jokes. Or maybe you had a stepfather like I did. My stepfather used to allow us to have so much fun when we would jump into dumpsters that were filled with feces and rats. But he made it fun because we had a game who could collect the most amount of cardboard and aluminum cans. And it was a competition between my sister and I. And we would figure out who could do the best so that once a month we would have a special meal called carne asada because we didn't have access to carne for an entire month because we were dumpster diving. And what my stepfather had and what the person who is living in a car with seven people who still has hope, that is called aspirational capital. You're still aspiring. You still have hope. Young people, you deserve aspirational capital. You deserve cultural capital. You deserve navigational capital. And you have it. Here's the problem. Is that in most schools, uh, Dr. Angela Valenzuela, who is an educator, who is out of UT Austin, she's a professor, she came up with a term called subtractive schooling. And what she says is that most Latinos, not all, that go to most public schools, not all public schools, They spend from kindergarten to 12th grade in these schools, but the more time they spend in school, the more things get subtracted from them. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. You're supposed to go to school. You're supposed to add stuff to my awareness, not subtract. And this is what happens to many Latino kids. They show up as Maria and they get turned into Mary. They show up as Cesar, and they get turned into Caesar. So you take away part of their identity that's subtracting. When you don't teach Maria and Cesar that they come from kings and queens, that they come from Machu Picchu and the great Inca civilization, that they come from Tikal and the great Mayan civilization, that they come from Tenochtitlan, Teotihuacan, Chichen Itza, from the great Mexica and Chichimeca and Tolteca civilizations. If you don't teach them that they come from architecture because it took architecture to build these places that are still around today, you, do you know that no earthquake has ever toppled the architectural design of the Incas, the Mayas, the Toltecas, the Mexicas? They're still there. Wow. You come from mathematics. You come from astrology and astronomy. You come from all of this great wealth. But if we don't get taught that in school, we start to feel like we're being burros or they're treating us like we're burros. We, we, we have a hard time passing mathematics and algebra or wanting to do calculus when it took mathematics to build these pyramids. We stop wanting to do science and astronomy when we studied. The reason we have such great uh, farming systems is because we studied the sun, the moon, the stars. And based on that, we knew when to plant. We know when to irrigate. We knew how to design the pyramid so it could hit at the right angle of the sun. Oh, my goodness. You come from geniuses. You come from so much community cultural wealth. And what we call intergenerational wisdom. But you know what? When you open up a U.S. history book, we're still not there. We've been here before the pilgrims arrive. But we're still not in the textbooks. So our history, our culture, our pride, our language, our roots, and our traditions, if they're not being taught in school, they're being subtracted from us. Also. We don't just speak English and Spanish. English is a beautiful language, and it comes from England. It is an import to the U.S. Spanish is a beautiful language, and it comes from Spain, and then it came 
to the Americas. But why don't we speak Nahuatl? How do we even spell Nahuatl? And what is Nahuatl? Nahuatl is the language of the Mexicas, of the Aztecas. Why don't we speak Mom, which is the language of Guatemala or of the Mayans? Why don't we speak Sotzil or Quechua? Because our mother tongues have been removed literally in school. There have been generations of kids before you who actually used to get hit in school and punished in school if they dared speak their mother tongue. If there are schools in this country today that do not allow you to speak Spanish in schools, they say, not here. That is the language for home. And with the message that they're sending, leave your culture at home, leave your language at home. That is not for school. So then you never feel like you're good enough. You never feel like your abuelita's language is important enough. So pretty soon, you're going to do what I did, is I started ignoring my abuelita. I no longer wanted to hear my abuelita's stories in high school. She was no longer smart enough to me. And because all of the books that I saw, this is not, what I'm about to say is not a message against white people. So please don't get offended when you hear this. But when the television shows were mostly white people, when the examples in the history books were mostly white people, I wanted to be white. I loved my white teachers. I didn't want to be Cesar anymore. I wanted to be Caesar. And that means that I started to hate my own mother and my own grandmother because they didn't speak the language of whites. They didn't think like I was being taught. So they were changing me, changing my mentality and making me in an indirect way, hate myself. And now I'm going to say something really powerful that are not my words. They're the words of the freedom fighter from South Africa. His name is Stephen Biko. Stephen Biko used to say, may he rest in peace. He was in a system of legal slavery called apartheid. And he said, the most potent weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So young people, people of all ages, if someone has you believing that you are not a mathematician, that you can't do calculus, where did you learn that? You learned that in school. If someone has you believing that you are not a scientist, where did you learn that? If you don't speak three or more languages, why? Where did you learn that? You learned that in school. And so our job, young people and people of all ages, is to reclaim the scientist in you, the mathematician in you, the genius in you, the cultura in you, the warrior in you, the intergenerational wisdom in you. It is in you. It's in your DNA. And the last thing I'll say, because I've given you a long answer on purpose, is we can prove now scientifically that we carry things in our DNA. We can prove it now. We've done studies in science. And so that kind of science is called epigenetics. If you look it up on Google or wherever you do your search and you type in epigenetics, it is the kind of science that if they test my DNA and compare it to the DNA of my mother, they can actually trace intergenerational trauma that has been passed on from generation to generation. So if for many generations they wouldn't teach us our culture, there's a reason why we don't speak Nahuatl anymore or Sotzil or Quechua. And, but if there's a field of science that has proven that in our DNA we carry trauma, I'm here to tell you that in your DNA is wisdom. You have pyramids in your DNA. You have architecture in your DNA. You can get not one doctorate, but all the doctorates in the world. There's going to be real barriers, no doubt. But can you do it? Yes, you can. You just have to get out of this thinking that has been given to you. A really bad gift was given to us. We were called lazy. We were called illegal. We were called burros. We were called less than. We were called minorities. And all of those words that they gave to us are planted in here. So when we take tests, we get afraid. 
we develop self-sabotage. We develop stereotype threat. We develop imposter syndrome. We start to believe, yo no puedo. Of course you can. You build pyramids. But you have a belief system that was given to you as a really horrible gift by not teaching you, by not showing you on TV. If they only show you on TV as a gardener or as a nanny or as a gang member, and no disrespect to our gardeners, no disrespect to our nannies, and no disrespect to our gang members. But if that's the only thing we see of Latinos on TV, or the only Latinos we see as successful are the light-skinned ones. We come in, we, we've been stripped since we were born of our, of our roots, because we, we've been born in a countries where being, um, they're being colonized by Europe, right? So we, we, we learn through our life in our own countries of, no, of being already half, half, right? I'm half Peruvian and, and half Argentina or half uh, Spain or half, we're, we're, and we come, when we decide to come to this country, we take a lot of courage for everybody, every single person, every single immigrant. I don't care if you're Latino, Chinese, or wherever you come in to start a new life to this country, you have what it takes to, to make it, right? You make the decision to come to this country. Um, then we, we keep getting stripped of those, you know, roots, right? Because we try to fit in, right? And there got to be a way where we can break the cycle because this is a cycle, right? This is happening every day as we speak. As we speak, we keep feeling that we don't belong and, and we try to belong, but we still have the accent. We still don't look alike, right? Um, in one moment, you feel like you needed to break that cycle and start homies and start start with this amazing movement of start... Um, building leaders, you know, start showing people that we can believe in ourselves, that we're true to ourselves, that we can do things. And the yes, if we live in this country, and I, I always say that, you know, um, I came here like everybody else, and, and I, I came from, from a good family where I having a good job in Peru. I was having a last name and everything was perfect. I came here, I was nobody. I started cleaning And, and I was treating really poorly because I didn't speak the language and I feel like I was treated like a retarded. And, and I was like, I was so frustrated and so angry, but I have the, I, be, I was lucky to, to channel my anger into try to get better and enroll myself in college to learn a language that if I learn a language, I can do something different and I can evolve, right? Uh, but I, I was lucky to have that drive. How can we, and you did too as well, you know, finding the, the issue and breaking this and say, you know what, let's, let's empower other people. How can we do this? How, how, how do you come with this idea and then start co-founding homies? You know, um, I'm realizing that I'm making some mistakes in this conversation. By the way, are you able to hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, at first, I called you Douglas. And then I called you Doug. And as you started speaking, I'm like, now I want to call you Douglas. <laughs> and I don't know. I, I never even asked you. No, that's fine. <laughs> no, it's not fine. That's Did part you, of the problem. What you, is the right pronunciation of your name? Well, it's, I mean, it's Spanish. Douglas, that's, it's funny because um, when I came here, um, they would ask, say, what's your name, right? And I say, Douglas. I, what, Douglas? Yeah. No, no. And they will no, your real name, your Spanish name. And it's like, yeah, my name is Douglas. And they were like, but Douglas is an American name. And I go, it's just a name. And the reason that my name is Douglas or Douglas is because my great, great father used to love the airplanes, right? And the first commercial airline that landed in Lima was a Douglas DC. I don't remember. And he named it my grandfather, Douglas. And then my grandfather named his first son, Douglas. And then my dad named me, Douglas. So we're three Douglas now. When my grand grandfather passed away, my dad too. So I'm the only Douglas in the family. But uh, but uh, it was in Peru was a real um, weird name, right, for someone to have. Here was so common that sometimes people believe that, you know, I name myself Douglas just to fit in. And no, not at all. <laughs> no, that's my name. But, um, but yeah, but this is this is sense of l l belonging, you know. How can we 
encourage people to feel that this is their own country. I don't care if you're a legal, legal permanent resident. If you're living here, you're working here, you're having family here, right? You're paying taxes somehow, you belong to society. This is your country. And I guess if we start to believe that, don't get me wrong, don't forget about I love my Peruvian roots and, and I love my culture, my food, and I love being Latino. But I, I also embrace that I'm here and I have to make a difference. How do you realize this in, in Kofan Homi? Because this is a way to make a difference. This is a way to, to see if I did it, if I can do it, you can do it. So how, how you start this movement? Yeah. First, thank you for sharing that because in just like less than two minutes, I saw you light up. And, and you went back a couple of generations. Just in two minutes, you shared about your grandfather. May he rest in peace. You shared about your father. May he rest in peace. And you're the last Douglas. And that's important. Names matter. So what, what I was trying to do there is we have to reclaim a little bit of our history. We have to reclaim our names. Um, understand those stories. And what a beautiful way to name you that Douglas is about the power of taking flight because it honors a company and this company that came to Lima, Peru. And uh, your grandfather was, uh, you know, named that way and inspired that way. And, and that has been passed on to you. Your mission in life might be to take off, to take flight, right? And so every single kid, every single adult deserves to take flight in their own way. They deserve to know their history of their father and their grandfather and their grandmother, et cetera, et cetera. What I was realizing in schools is that there were some kids that were always getting in trouble. And they didn't have a particular ethnic group. It wasn't just Latinos. It wasn't just any group. There were certain kids that never fit in. And I hadn't done my research yet, but right now in 2020, and the numbers are going to change because of the coronavirus, but in 2019, 3 million kids were recorded as having dropped out of high school. 3 million. That's huge. That's a huge amount of students. But there's a lot of kids that drop out in eighth grade that don't get counted. And I had been a teacher for 15 years. Um, this was 11 years ago, and I kept seeing some of my students drop out. And then I kept seeing sometimes us pushing them out by having difficult rules that some of our kids had a hard time dealing with. For example, they had to get to school at a certain time, and if they did it, then they had then they got punishment and detention and if they didn't go to detention then they got suspension and if they had enough suspensions then they got expelled but we never found out why that kid was coming late to school they didn't have access to food they didn't have access to transportation some of them were doing daycare and they're only 14 years old we never found out and so or for example this one is very very controversial Whenever we hear a kid that has a weapon, the rules of schools are you're automatically expelled from school forever. But what happens if a kid lives in a dangerous neighborhood and they've been bullied all of their life and they have to walk through different barrios to get to school? And that happens in so many neighborhoods all over the world. And a kid is carrying a weapon not because they want to hurt anybody, not because they're violent, not because they're criminals. They're actually doing it because they're scared and no one is there to protect them. And the response we give to that kid is not only are we going to expel you, but we're going to call the police and we're going to have you arrested. I kept seeing that over and over again, Douglas. And then every year, for about nine years, I averaged between three and 15 funerals that I attended every year of little kids under the age of 18. And I would go to the funeral home and I would see the same scenario. Another kid who had been killed, another kid who had been murdered, mother crying, uh, their friends really upset, wanting to get revenge. 
And I was like, we have to do something different. The schools are failing them. The after-school programs are failing them. The jails are failing them. We are failing these kids. And so Homies Empowerment was born in 2009 as a way to look at kids differently, especially kids in gangs. Now, when we think about gangs in the Latin American context, that is like the biggest boogeyman ever. When we say Latino gangs in Latin America, we think terror, we think of violence, and we want to take all of those human beings and throw them in some prison and lock them up forever, or even worse, Sometimes we think that way about kids in this country as well. And most adults don't understand why kids join gangs. I'm not an advocate for gangs, and I'm also not against gangs. Let me explain what I mean. This answer is going to take a while because homies is a concept that is kind of like best friends that might be in a gang or best friends from the street friends that watch each other and take care of each other. Some kids join a gang because they're looking for family. Some kids join a gang because they're looking for a brother or sister. Some kids join a gang because that gang protects them and they're tired of being beat up. Some kids join a gang because it's their best friends. Some kids join a gang because it's been part of the family culture. Some kids, kids join a gang because their pride They have a lot of pride in their neighborhood or their block. And not everything that a gang does is bad, believe it or not. They're not shooting every minute of the day. They're not doing graffiti every minute of the day. So what are they doing 24-7? I, as a teacher, decided to become a student of gangs. And I saw perfect attendance. I saw mentorship companionship, familia, the passing of cultura. And I wondered, I was sitting in these backyards studying gangs in Oakland, and I wondered, like, I think gangs are doing something really important that society is not. If you want gangs to end, don't break up families. If you want gangs to end, have children feel safe. If you want gangs to end, protect all citizens. Gangs are meeting the needs of a society that the society is not meeting. I'm going to describe you an organization, and you, and, and you may have heard this before because I spoke at JFK before, but if you haven't, this is for your listeners and the audience. I'm going to describe an organization where you have to wear a certain color, you have to be loyal, you have to be trustworthy, you have to put in work, and you have to sell product. Some people think I'm describing gangs, but I'm describing the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts have to wear a certain color. They have to be loyal. They have a sisterhood. They have to protect each other, and they have to sell cookies. They do. That's how they raise their money. We love Girl Scouts, but we hate gangs, and we don't understand gangs. And here's the second part of it is we hate graffiti. Because graffiti vandalizes private property. But kids graffiti four things, and they're really important. They graffiti their name because they want you to notice them. They feel invisible, and they want you to see, this is my nickname, see me. They graffiti the name of their neighborhood because they're proud. They have pride. They uh, graffiti the words, rest in peace and the name of someone because they're sad that their dad just passed away or their best friend just passed away and they're in mourning and they're in pain and they don't know what to do with their pain. And then the last thing that they graffiti is the word free and their friend who's locked up. So they, so, so when we say to these kids, your name doesn't matter. Your neighborhood pride doesn't matter. The fact that you're sad because someone died doesn't matter. And the fact that you want freedom for a family member doesn't matter. And we erase that with white paint. What we're trying to erase is pain, pride, themselves, and they're yearning for freedom for their family. Now, we can do graffiti 
without having to ever break the law. We can purchase walls, we can purchase material, we can purchase canvas, but graffiti doesn't have to be seen as a bad thing. However, Budweiser and Corona, they do graffiti in my neighborhood, but because they paid for the space, they put half naked human beings, mostly women, they sell alcohol, they sell things that hurt our community, and we don't call that graffiti. We call that advertisement. I call it corporate graffiti because you're vandalizing our neighborhood trying to sell us poison, trying to sell us sexism. So I say all of that, that you have kids that join gangs, kids that are doing graffiti, kids that get pushed out of school, kids that get locked up in this country starting at the age of 10. We have kids right now locked up in Alameda County jail for kids. We call it juvenile hall. They're locked up in a cage, hermano, kids. So we started Homies Empowerment to say, mijo and mija, you matter. You're not what they say you are. You're not bad. Maybe you made bad choices. There's no such thing as a bad kid. Maybe you made some mistakes. Would you welcome back to school? Welcome back to the organization. And we look at them not as troublemakers or as thugs. We look at them in four ways. As a warrior, as a healer, as a scholar, and as a hustler. And when we receive people that way, they start to shine. Young people want to feel like they matter, like they belong, like they're loved. And now, Douglas, we're turning our after-school program that's 11 years old, and we're building a high school. And so we're excited to do that. Imagine a high school where there's no subtractive schooling. Imagine a high school where abuelitas are in every classroom, grandmothers. Imagine a school where you're not welcomed by police, but you're welcomed by grandmothers who give you a hug or give you a chanclazo and tell you to get to class or they give you a hug. Imagine a school where there's no fences, but the fence is made of corn and made of cactus so that we could protect, but we could feed the people with our fence. Imagine a school where the advisors are sisters and brothers who are in prison right now doing life sentence. They changed their life, they have multiple degrees, but they're never gonna get out of this cage. But what if with this Zoom technology, they could zoom into a classroom and be amazing advisors to kids, even from prison? So this is the school that we're designing, Douglas, and we're hoping that we can open it next year in Oakland, California, and that it's a model of doing things. But our organization right now is opening up a store where people shop for free. We call it a freedom store because you shouldn't have to have money to have your basic needs. Water, food, clothes, shelter should be a human right. And what we're providing is food, water, toiletries for our community. And we open up this store where about a thousand people come and shop for free. And they come every single week on Tuesdays and they line up for hours. Um, and we're taking care of our community during COVID-19, but also during such heavy poverty in Walnut Creek. In every neighborhood, you're going to see more and more of our people who are homeless who are living in cars, who are living on the street. And it wasn't because of COVID-19. It's because we have a virus of poverty and neglect, and we have forgotten that we are our brothers and our sisters' keeper. And we are watching people go hungry, and many of us, including myself, was doing nothing about it. And I'm tired of that. And what Homies Empowerment is trying to do is say, we're going to do something about it. Looks like what you describe is that uh, obviously uh, it was a need for its basic human needs, right? Um, look for community, look for for mentorship, look for sense of belonging, right? Um, and it's the the our community in general, society felt them, right? And there's a reason that it, they 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 start making bad decision and on top of that being kids you know when, when when your kids or any kid make a wrong decision because it's in early ages doesn't have the the ability right to have a to to make a good decision we punish them even harder and 
put lock them up and start building them as a criminals and 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 show them a path, right? So what we're doing is the the opposite way, right? We 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 should be doing the other way, right? Because you put someone in 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 a facility that is gonna educate that person to keep doing whatever they see in the surrounding. So if we do the other way, right? If if we get these people education and we guide them to the right side, right? To the to the other side, um, is where we make the difference, right? So right now there are a lot of Latinos that don't have college degree, let alone you know a, a earn a doctoral degree. In what in in what way do Latinos, uh, which advance degrees, support the Latino community and advocate advocate for Latino socioeconomic success? So if if you if are we empowering Latinos that get success to share the love? with our community, is that happening? Or we still have to work more and get those people? You know, I think about people like Doctora Castro. Doctora Castro has a doctorate degree. She plays a leadership role at JFK University. She is one of those shining examples of a Latina who has figured out a way to navigate all of these systems, get multiple degrees, all the way to a doctorate and is empowering and supporting another generation of people. There's a lot of Doctora Castro's out there, but we need more. You know, um, the last time that I saw a study, less than 2% of Latinos have access to get a doctoral degree. And it doesn't mean we're not smart enough. There's just a lot of barriers along the way. We talked about the barriers from kindergarten to 12th grade, where there's a huge barrier called subtractive schooling, where we're not made to believe that we can. We need to have a campaign where we see doctoras and doctores everywhere in sports, in medicine, in science, in mathematics, in education, de todo. So whatever a kid is into, they can see role models that look like them with doctoral degrees. And, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing, but we don't always get those examples. But then when you start community college or when you start a university, a four-year university or a private university, sometimes the universities don't understand that some Latinos, now Latinos are not the same. We are not a poor people. We are not a rich people. We are a many things people. We are a, a beautiful diversity and a diaspora of people. But if you're a first-generation Latino going to college in the United States, if you're first-generation, it means that you haven't had other generations that have known how to navigate all of the systems that are there. What does enrollment mean and admissions? And why are these deadlines so strict? And what about financial aid? And what happens when I get the same financial aid as someone else, but I'm taking care of my entire family and the rent is rising and I have to have one, two or three jobs. And how do I navigate all of the systems of support that may be on campus or not? And what happens if I dominate a language like Spanish, but I don't dominate English? Is the support in my language? Uh, is the information in the resources in my language? And do I even have Latino studies on my campus? Is Latino studies a bachelor's degree I can get? or a master's degree, or a doctorate degree I can get. Sometimes when you go to universities and they don't even have a Latino studies um, major, I hate to tell you this university, but what you're saying is you don't value our history. And most schools in this country do not value our history enough to declare it a major. Let alone, imagine getting a doctorate in Chicano Latino studies. That's beautiful, but there's very few schools in the country that do that. And so it's important for us as institutions to think about our Latino students that are dreamers, that may be undocumented, those that may have a hard time economically, those that may have linguistic skills in another language like Spanish or Nahuatl or Mum, uh, those students that might be holding two, three jobs, those students that may have families. And what does it mean in every single class at the university Every class should have three things, a window, a mirror, and a sliding door. So when you open the syllabus for math or science or English or history, if it has a mirror, that means that some of the scientists that we're going to study are Latino scientists. 
That's a mirror because when I look at the syllabus, wow, look, there's Latino scientists on the syllabus or Latino mathematicians. That's when you can see yourself in the syllabus, the mirror. The syllabus needs to have windows so I can look to see, wow, there's African-American scientists in the syllabus so I can see another cultura. And there's a sliding door so I get to practice being that mathematician and walk through the sliding door, open it and walk through and practice being a scientist. And so every syllabus needs to have these things. Here's the problem. You go to biology, to mathematics, to science, to history, to English, and you still don't see Latinos in the curriculum. You don't see them in the readings. You don't see them as the scholarly subjects. Or when you do, I went to Harvard University to get my doctorate. I read a lot of articles about Latinos, so I was happy. But do you know the kind of articles I read? They were horrible articles. All they said is the negative things about our community. They didn't paint an accurate picture. So it's not enough to have Latinos in the syllabus and in the readings. What kind of article is it? Let me give you a specific example. There's been a mythology that has been passed on for hundreds of years that still has not been proven to be true that says the Aztec people sacrificed human beings. A lot of that writing was first from Spaniards who came to colonize and later from European scholars. And it is their interpretation of ceremonies that they were seeing. There's been no evidence that the Mexicas ever sacrificed people. But if you keep teaching a lie long enough, it becomes the truth. So you might have the Aztecs in your curriculum. You might show Mayan math and the concept of the zero. But if you show the wrong history and you show mythology, you're perpetuating negative stereotypes that are hurting our community. So the Latino community deserves support, um, understanding their genius, bringing their wealth into the classroom, understanding multiple languages, understanding our, uh, many of us, our sense of comunidad, that our success becomes our community's success. If your tia does well, we celebrate that. It becomes your success. If your abuelo does well, may he rest in peace. It is part of your success. We traditionally come from, and not all Latinos, but most, we come from a communal way of learning. So when you say it's only your GPA and only your grades matter, every time we come into class, we start to build community. We want to get to know our classmates and we want them to be successful. But you set up learning only for your grades, only for your GPA, only for your graduation. That's not healthy. That's not communal. Let's rise together. What if we had a class GPA and a communal GPA? And what if part of my grade was in helping my sister and brother? That part of my final assignment isn't just turning in a great paper. It's Douglas helps Cesar, so Douglas's grade goes up because he was a great helper to Cesar. And he gets his bachelor's, and I get my bachelor's, and we rise together. We don't have that kind of educational system yet unless you change it. Anyone listening from universities, you have the power to do grades differently. You have the power to do learning differently. Let's do it a different way. And then you're going to see people rise. But listen, even though there's 12 million of us that are undocumented, we're still going to college. We're still paying taxes. They say that the undocumented Latino community is the largest block of taxpayers in the U.S. They pay taxes every time they go to the store, every time they fill out taxes with their I-10 number. But they're paying all of these things to society but they're not getting the same access to healthcare and to education. That's not right. That's not fair. We need to change that. And I think all of these things, and we as Latinos, your question is, are we helping enough? We need to do more. I need to do more. I've been lucky enough and blessed enough through the support of my grandmother, my teachers, my community, my barrio, my mentors, that I have a doctorate degree. I have to give scholarships. I have to give mentorship. I have to listen and help students apply. I have to share my navigational capital. Because listen, when you know how to fill out a FAFSA, you can help someone else fill out a FAFSA form. That's a financial aid form. And that is a way that you give back. 
every, every February, every single Latino could be doing workshops with their comunidad, helping them with the FAFSA. Every October, we could be helping people with applications. That didn't cost any money. It just takes a little bit of cariño, care, and time so that we help other people apply. But I hope this conversation, if you're not Latino and you're listening or watching, it's about all of us coming together, all of us as a human family. The only thing is that oftentimes Latinos in this country have only been asked to be workers. Douglas was successful. Douglas was educated. Douglas was doing great in Peru. And then he comes here and then he gets dehumanized and treated like he's not smart. So many of our people that are coming from Latin America have multiple degrees, very, very intelligent, but we get treated like we're scum. And I don't want to get too much into politics, but the president of the United States starts to call us murderers and rapists. That's not okay. We shouldn't allow that. We shouldn't be okay with that. We have to say Latinos are our family. They're part of our human family. And we all progress together. We have neighbors in Walnut Creek and Oakland and Concord and everywhere that we live. And what would it mean for us to take care of each other? Of It takes an entire barrio, an entire community, and we come up together. That is the role of Latino leaders and all leaders and all human beings. Definitely, uh, Dr. Cesar. It's time to break the cycle. And I know pr pretty much we say that all the time, uh, but uh, it's time to uh, empower and, yes, empower. Empower uh, Latinos, empower Hispanics, Hispan empower people in general to to improve their community and be responsible for that. You know, it, it goes... Uh, it, I remember asking you this question before um, that uh, how can we, you know, clone you, you know, how can you clone it, people that are looking into get um, into a, a spread education, empowerment in, 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 in leadership, right? Um, I guess it's a conversation that it needs to happen often and if more often that it's, it's been happening right now. I want to thank you for your time. It's really inspiring um, having this conversation, and we can go for hours. I know that you and me can go for hours talking about this because you're passionate, I'm very passionate, and, and there's a mission that um, that I feel I have um, since the time that I uh, discovered the challenges of being a, a foreigner in the beginning of this country and, and things that I... I, I, I um, I have to live and think that I see other people live and think that I see people living. And, and, and now, I guess, we're in the position that we can help a little bit, but we need more people that join the movement. So I want to thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, and, and, and we need to keep the compromise of keep helping, keep looking for, for leaders, keep, you know, riding the car on the right direction. And, and, and I think what you're doing is it's is, is great part And we need to replicate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Cesar. Thank you. And the last thing I'll just say is that if we get examples and we have an opportunity to practice, that's all we need. When we learn about Lucy Gonzalez Parsons and Lolita Lebron and Aidy Santa Maria and Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, when we learn about the United Farm Workers and Teatro Campesino, when we learn about La Raza Unida Party, when we learn about Ernesto Che Guevara, when we learn about Tupac Amaru, when we learn these things, and then we have an opportunity to practice, we don't need to clone. What we do is we get examples, and in those examples, we get inspiration, and then we practice, and then we become ourselves through all of these amazing examples of so many amazing Latino leaders that we have and that we have had and that we will always have. But if we don't get taught them, We think we can't. And so whatever you think is the truth. If you think you can't, you can. But you, if you think you can and you get the example and you practice the powerful words of the United Farm Workers, of course, que si se puede. Of course. Of course we can. Of course you se puede. Thank you so much, Dr. Cesar. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Cesar Cruz. In our next episode, Dr. Pilar Egues Guevara will talk about mentorship. Nos vemos.